so I'm going to talk about the, this long title thing called the Power of Functional Programming and, uh, and Static Type Systems in Server-Side Web Apps. And uh, so this is kind of the underlying motivation for doing Hyper. And, uh, and then some, and the second half is about Hyper itself. So there will be a lot of uh, kind of sketchy things around uh, web apps and, and uh, server side and, and so on uh, at first. All right, so my original title was uh, a bit more of a pun and, and I didn't like dare to use it for conferences, but uh, you can see it here. Uh, this was kind of the starting point. And uh, yeah, uh, maybe I should like start introducing myself for you. Those of you who don't know who I am. Uh, so uh, my name is Oscar, and uh, I live in Malmö in Sweden. And uh, my kind of starting point for programming, or before programming, was music. And then uh, we had to do like a band site. So I learned PHP uh, a couple of years ago when. Yeah, I was kind of the designated band guy, band site guy who had to learn PHP to get the get the frames and the tables all set up. And uh, yeah, not long after that, I was kind of you know introduced to Haskell and all that, and saved by FP, as you probably have been all of you <laughs> at some point. Uh, and last year, I worked with this uh, language called Odin, which was a, a functional programming language that compiled to uh, to Go so source code. Uh, at least that was kind of a, a, a midway step. Uh, but the, the point was to to integrate with the Go and to compile and to interoperate with Go seamlessly. And uh, eventually, I realized that that was too big of a project to do all by myself. So I decided to put my efforts into you know, supporting languages that I think are good. And uh, then I got back into PureScript again, because my first, uh, like, uh, my first um, uh, period with PureScript was doing PureScript spec, I think, two or two and a half years ago, so started uh, experimenting with PureScript. And then I kind of took a break from it, doing this Odin thing. And, and then I started in doing PureScript again this last year in the fall. And, uh, yeah. And at work, I'm, I'm uh, working with a project called CodeScene, and we're doing mostly closure code. So uh, I'm not doing PureScript or Haskell at work currently. OK, so today we're going to take like a general overview of uh, functional programming and web applications. And most of this you probably already know. So this talk is kind of aimed at uh, a lot of different levels. So maybe we could do this part faster. And uh, a bit about server-side rendering uh, versus single page apps and so on. And then we'll look at static typing for server-side web, what's already out there and kind of my, my aim with all this. And then we're going to go into Hyper. And we will look at uh, the old design and the new design as a way to, to see. I had this first design, which kind of broke down at, at one point. And I want to, like an example, show how, how it broke down and how we can make it even safer. And then we will look at the type level routing. And uh, it's kind of fun because. Uh, it seems like um, uh, it's not like uh, uh, super many people have seen Hyper or whatever, but uh, uh, this is kind of the flashy feature, but this isn't really Hyper, it's another library, but we will look at it anyway. Uh, the XHR client stuff is kind of building on top of the type level routing and like, yet another extension you can do. And then I'm going to go into some of the stuff I haven't done yet, but uh, that would be nice to explore. So starting off with the functional programming and 
web apps. So this is uh, like the motivation for, for me working on Hyper and making it what it is. Uh, so functional programming kind of influences JavaScript, right? You, uh, of all people, should know this, right? Um, so we have like uh, the JavaScript standard moving towards FP in some sense with the, the higher order functions and so on. Uh, all of these libraries like underscore and lodash, lambda and so on. And the fantasy land specification is trying to do like the full monad thing. Um, things like React integrating some functional con concepts inside their architecture or their design and a lot of libraries and and like the community is pushing for doing FRP in, in, in their applications. Also you have this thing where JavaScript is a compilatory for FP languages. It kind of go, goes both ways in a sense. But still, uh, and this is kind of my itch here, uh, it's still a lot of focus on single page apps. Right? So I am this uh, old grumpy, not, not perhaps old, but at least grumpy <laughs> person about uh, uh, about service side and, and uh, you know supporting all browsers and whatnot. Uh, so single page apps, uh, as you may know, they're like desktop apps in a way. And you have all these frameworks since I don't know for how long, like ten years at least. You have had Angular and Backbone, kind of the starting point, and then all the 500 others. Um, yeah, those kinds of ones. And uh, you know, without JavaScript, you get nothing. If for some reason you can't load JavaScript, execute it, or whatever, someone has made an, an, an error somewhere, stuff just breaks down, you get a, like a blank page or a dead page, or something like that. Um, and it tends to, these frameworks tend to kind of reinvent features already in browsers. And also in a way, browsers have uh, kind of adapted to this and uh, provided features for single page app frameworks to work more nicely, like the being able to do push state uh, history and so on. But I feel there is kind of a duplication going on with uh, routing and forms and, and people reinventing the wheel uh, in a sense. So what about this old server-side rendering we used to do uh, or people used to do in the 90s and, and 2000s? Um, there's this thing called progressive enhancement which tries to, uh, to, to, to do both things, not like make a binary choice so we can do service side rendering as a base and then we can do something other uh, as a nice layer on top. And it's about kind of um, deciding on a, a lower bound of support saying that everyone that has a browser or a device capable of something greater than X should get a working application in some sense. And as the device gets better you get an um, even more nice experience so maybe if you coming in with ie8 or something you can post all the forms you can click all the links you can do their stuff but you won't be getting the webgl and fancy animations and uh, also there's oh sorry uh, there's this other aspect of progressive enhancement that i'm really really into which is kind of this power law distribution thing where supposedly all of your features and all of your code isn't equally important. And uh, like you have a small part of some application or a smaller part that provides like the core business value or the, the, the like the value proposition of your product. And then you have all these supporting code and, and supporting parts of the applications doing things like login and settings, payments, integration with other stuff, uh, I don't know, forums, uh, all that kind of secondary content and, and so on. 
and they usually do not need links or uh, sorry do not need uh, JavaScript to function and like coding all of that in React or whatever should maybe not be that beneficial and uh, perhaps you could focus on doing the, the single page apps and the fancy stuff where people are spending the, their time in their product and, and do that. that uh, the other 80% to just be things and forms. Uh, so there's this uh, a thing as well called isomorphic or later rebranded as universal web applications. And uh, the goal of these are to, uh, to kind of, I see people kind of shaking their heads, not right now, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, the goal of, uh, of uh, universal web application is to kind of transparently provide one framework where you write your app and, and it works on the client side or at the back end, the server side render as well without you doing uh, two applications. Uh, and this, I am very kind of skeptical. Oh, sorry. I missed the bullet points here. Uh, so uh, I, I quote this, it's a free progressive enhancement. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical about this, uh, mostly due to these being kind of two different models. So you have the, the, the client center model with uh, single page apps and you have the server side render model. And they, they execute in, in very different ways where you, in one model, uh, having all the state in the client, all the browsing, uh, you know, both the, the kind of CRUD state and also the browsing state and, and the view state. And uh, uh, in a server-side render app, you're uh, changing state by, by traversing links and posting forms. So it's fundamentally different, I think. And uh, I can't see how in a usable way a framework could kind of be transparent and just swap those. So maybe we're really talking about some kind of initial rendering thing. And that's like the canonical example of universal web apps, which is kind of strange. But that's what, uh, like what I've seen work uh, so far, where you, you get some HTML on, on the server side rendered uh, page and like search engines can, can do something with that. Yeah, anyway, so um, there's another kind of cheap hack called PJAX, which is an old one, and uh, it's still kind of nice. We're using this for the code scene application. Uh, so this is basically hooking into all the links and all the forms. And uh, as you click one of those uh, or submit the form, uh, PJAX hooks in and requests a page with AJAX instead using a special header which the server knows about and it only responds with the inner content of the page so not the entire html with the head and scripts and all that just a, like a main container and pjax swaps that in the dom very simple and you get a, a faster faster navigation and page load kind of experience so still a bit uh, rough this is very simple and kind of breaks down in, in some cases, but works for, for some parts. Uh, anyway, so uh, we have this server-side thing, and we want to, to kind of keep this same base, but do progressive enhancement and do nice things on top. So I think if we have these kind of problems with server-side that the tooling isn't really there, then maybe we could kind of build nicer tools and, and make this better, because I think the the end goal here is, is still very nice. And maybe we shouldn't kind of sacrifice this and, and just go full single page everywhere. And um, I think we could use better languages than we are using right now. And uh, I'm not looking at you, <laughs> uh, maybe more like the industry. Uh, and I think we could make use of, of type systems to, to kind of, you know, use static typing for service at web in some kind of specialized way and apply static typing in that context to do um, better, better tooling for, for doing service at web apps. So uh, 
we have seen all these uh, mainstream languages in server-side uh, web programming. We have uh, like the dynamically typed uh, things like PHP and Ruby with Rails and you know all of them, and also the the object-oriented mainstream things like Java and C Sharp and all their frameworks and, and JSP and whatever, all the streamly type stuff. And uh, when these programs grow big and when the teams grow big, we have a problem with not having any compile time guarantees and stuff breaks. And uh, I think we should be able to kind of abstract things and, and compose things sanely in web programming and in like templates or middleware or whatever you have. And uh, we should be you know, confident that the stuff works together. And uh, yeah, we should also be able to maintain code and refactor, change, and delete code. Uh, not only like build the initial thing and then say, yeah, this works because of some reason, but uh, we should be able to change each other's code and our old code. And also, I think we should have a good developer experience around this and it has doesn't have to be really shiny and you know but it has to have a good documentation and all that so there are some things i found in this context and for haskell we have uh, as some examples to probably others but uh, you have the yesov framework which is probably the, the larger one most mature web framework for haskell and then you have servant which is a, like my personal favorite and which leaks into the high of work as well. Uh, for Scala, and disclaimer, I don't know Scala very well, so I'm just uh, name dropping here. Uh, Play is the mature big framework used by many, and they have like compile time checking for routes and, and, and just type shape parameters and stuff like that. And there's a project called Row, which I found uh, that are that is similar to the servant, it seems. In PureScript, we have uh, the Express wrapper for PureScript, which is basically Node Express middleware and applications wrapped in the in PureScript types. And also the PureScript REST framework, which tries to uh, do some, uh, should I say, more type safe routing and encapsulate the, the concept of, of RESTful resources. And uh, if you look at other frameworks, not necessarily like Haskell and and, uh, and so on, um, you usually find this middleware construct. And in Elixir, you have something called plug, which has this kind of architecture. In Node, you have Express and Connect, which uh, has middleware. If you go back to uh, servlets in Java, you have filters. Uh, I'm not sure about C Sharp, but it seems like this middleware concept is showing up everywhere. And um, it's very generic and powerful in a way because it's basically just a function transforming a request and response in some order and uh, ending up responding to, uh, to the request. Uh, but it's very easy if you uh, if you don't have any uh, uh, static typing to to like make them in the wrong order. And I think I have some bullet points where I did forget here. Yeah, so <laughs> easy to mess up if you're not if the middleware isn't statically typed and you can uh, change the order without getting compiled errors. You might end up with incorrectly interleaved effects. And uh, if you're working in something like uh, 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 Node, you can get this incorrect ordering. You can, you can do like uh, 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 corrupt or incomplete responses, which means you can uh, basically uh, try to first uh, respond to your request and then write headers or whatever. Uh, you can do uh, have different callbacks writing to the same response. Uh, you can 
forget to do error handling or have it in the wrong order or something like that. Lots of strange things. You can try to consume the, the body of a request without having parsed it correctly and like forgotten to add the JSON body of the parser or something like that. And you can entirely leave out uh, authentication and authorization uh, by doing some strange uh, uh, ordering thing, or usually, like if you're refactoring things, these these things are not guaranteed to be in the same setup as they were before. So it's tricky and very scary to, to change the middleware setup afterwards if you're going into an application that's already working. Uh, that's kind of nasty. Uh, already. Uh, and if you're doing all this and uh, you're in, say, closure and you're doing it wrong, you will end up with a nice little screen or two screens, really, with all this. And uh, yeah, then you go home and cry for a long time. But if you look at this, uh, I, I've kind of faded it out for, for your sanity, but uh, there's actually one line here about my application. Uh, so it says cozy in at some point, but you, you, uh, these are mostly crap, uh, nothing of interest at all. And uh, this is at one time, of course. So I don't want this. So I had this idea of combining PureScript and doing the middleware uh, abstraction together. And because I had, had some. Uh, some idea that the, the pure script records might be something here to that they could apply to this problem nicely. And also this was inspired by a talk on Idris uh, by Edwin Brady, and he talked about doing uh, uh, state machines and, and using the Idris type system to encode like how the state machine could change types and so on. And this turned out to be very powerful and very nice. For, uh, for the middleware stuff as well. So this was where the Hyper project started. And uh, I'm going to assume that you all know some PureScript syntax. And usually that's not the case when I do the presentation. So people tend to be uh, utterly lost and confused. And But I hope this time maybe uh, I, I can you will follow along and see what I'm, I'm talking about here. If not, you can just stop me. Uh, I don't know if I can see the chat window right now, but you can perhaps uh, start your microphone and, and just ask questions. And uh, I really encourage you to ask some questions because there's probably things here that uh, would be nice to discuss. Okay. Um, so the goals of Hyper is to provide a common API for middleware. And this is really the main uh, main thing with Hyper, the library itself. Uh, I said something earlier about uh, the, the type level routing not being Hyper in itself. This is really what Hyper is about, this API and, and the, like the naming conventions and the, uh, the classes around. Uh, doing requests and, and doing responses. And for that, it's also a goal to make the effects of applying these middleware explicit in the types. So the things I talked about earlier with middleware coming in the incorrect order, uh, the type system should catch that, and each middleware should be an action like from a type to a type, and the relevant parts should be included in those types to, to express, express what it does. And these should be safely you know, composable and uh, should be you should be able to write your own application components as middleware and compose those with uh, external things from third party stuff. These should be backend agnostic uh, where possible and that means because right now there's uh, practically only a node server. There's also a test server backend, but the node.js server is the main one. 
and you can write middleware that's not coupled to any of the, these backends. So, it, and that takes some tricky stuff to for the to to kind of decouple the, the backends and the, doing stuff like reading a body or streaming response and so on. But it should be possible. And also, it should be interoperable with uh, different language backends. Uh, I haven't tried this yet because I got stuck on a lot of things, but I tried doing a pure script native port at some point. I, I want to pick that up again sometime. And also the Erlang backend would be nice to try it. And one big uh, goal is to not have any magic in this in this frame. So that means no pre-processing or and no uh, no code generation or funky stuff. Just Regular script, and it has worked so far. That's nice. So uh, we will look at the design, uh, and first off, uh, the, the absolute core concept of the connection. But then we will look at the, the old design uh, first. So yeah, you've been warned. The connection is a record where you have a request and a response. So that's no big surprise. And having those together, it's meant for modeling the whole connection, like the logic of the connection as a, as a whole, uh, both the request and response being the same value. And this is a design that I stole from, from Plug in Elixir. Without really, I wasn't sure that this was better than anything else, but it kind of made sense because we're in this middleware approach. You're passing this connection down. You are transforming it uh, in in a sequence of functions, basically. So it seemed reasonable to have a single value with them both tied together. And uh, there is also this thing called components, which might seem more confusing. And it is, and uh, yeah, it's uh, just kind of a way of plugging in some arbitrary extra stuff which uh, middleware might provide. So for instance, if you have a authentication middleware, you might add some kind of user or whatever authentication value here after having done a successful authentication flow. And that isn't directly tied to either the request or the response, more like the whole handling of this connection. So that's why it's a separate thing. And I'm not sure this should be here at all. So it might go away. Uh, we'll see. I, I want to kind of see where this goes with other libraries and so on, see who uses what and, and how it fits. Okay, so the old design for this middleware thing was uh, kind of simple. Uh, here we see the, the type signature. And it's uh, a middleware is just an ADS for a function uh, taking a connection, C, and uh, returning a, a, another connection, C prime, in, in some M type. So this is usually like a monad or a fictive or whatever. And it, yeah, it's a regular. Uh, type synonym, so no new type or anything, which is kind of nice in a way, because if you uh, squint at this, you might recognize the, the function signature part as the signature for bind in on that, or the type as bind, which means you can use the regular policy uh, arrows to compose these middleware, or you could in the old design. So uh, here we see a chain of three middleware chained together using Plyce arrows. And uh, so to, to see what's going on here, we take a connection and it gets passed into authenticate user. It returns another connection. That gets passed into plus form, returns another connection, passed into state to do, and then you get back some uh, connection value. Mm -hmm. So composing these, you return a uh, a new middleware. And this seems all good and all safe, right? Uh, until you have one week before you're going to a conference 
where you know Edwin Brady is in the audience and you discover, oh my God, I have a, a big hole <laughs> in my design here and he's gonna spot it like this is uh, not good at all. So um, at this point, this was yeah, one, be one week before Cats Comp in February. Um, I sent to uh, Gary, uh, Gary B, you probably know him. Um, and I was like in panic, uh, you have to help me here. I'm, I'm going to your conference and I'm going to speak about this and it's broken. So uh, and he just whipped together uh, Index Monads library and like, yeah, uh, use this and you'll be fine. So <laughs> uh, I redesigned this with Index Monads instead, which turned out a bit differently. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to show you how this breaks down. Um, this is with the old design still. Uh, so here we we do a middleware which doesn't use the ply spin errors, but we use uh, a do block and we are explicit with the connection values. So first, the, the bad middleware takes a connection, and then it responds to uh, yeah yeah uh, it responds using that connection uh, and getting back another connection. It ignores that. The resulting connection and response again with the first one. So um, here we are doing the same kind of side effect twice, which we're we're only supposed to do that side effect once. We can't respond to an HTTP request twice. Um, so by by being able to because the problem here is uh, our type safety is in the uh, connection value the type of the connection. That's where the type safety kind of lies. And we're as we're able to handle these connection values ourselves, we're able to do bad things because we can just discard the values and then we, uh, we lose the type safety. So what we need to do here is kind of hide the connection values somehow. And that's where the index monitors come in. So the solution to this is uh, doing this instead, you can see the difference. Instead of taking an explicit connection value and passing it around, we're just uh, chaining together actions, and the connection is kind of uh, hidden within here, inside the monad. And this is the new design where you have this is basically the index state monad straight up. Uh, so here you have four type parameters instead of, well, uh, we had three last time, I think. But we have uh, M for the monad or applicative or uh, something like that. And then we have I and O, where I is the input and O is the output. And this means uh, this action is transforming the inner, inner connection from type I to type O when you apply it uh, or when you bind this action. And then A is the, re the return type, like a monad return type. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, well, so if we're going to solve this uh, double respawn problem from before, uh, we need to we, we need to have some type safety, type safety around uh, what things we can do in what, what order. So we will look at the uh, the state uh, state transitions of the response, which are possible in hyper, and um, how they save us from from doing the wrong thing. So in HTTP, we can kind of see it like this. Um, we have uh, uh, this is like the same state changes of an HTTP request uh, or the HTTP response. Sorry. So we can only uh, write the status as the first thing we're doing. You can write the first line. It's uh, like HTTP 1.1, 200, okay. And then we're transitioning into another state, headers open. From there, we can write headers how many we want, and we can eventually close the headers. And then we go to the body open state. From there, we can send chunks of like, body bytes and uh, eventually, we can end 
and the response, and then we're in the response end of the time. So uh, these are the states we want to, to encode uh, around the connection to, to make it safe. And to do that, we need, or we're making it more readable by introducing this type alias for the transition itself. So, um, oh, sorry, let me skip this. Uh, the, the state transition is a, a type alias or uh, a middleware where if you look at the type parameters here, you see it takes an M, that's the monad, or something like that, or, yeah, sorry, and uh, it takes the response in the connection. Uh, it takes a from and a to, and the from and to are the from and to states we're transitioning between. And then it operates on whatever request and whatever components, so we just for all them. And it's a middleware, and it takes a connection, or it transforms from a connection where the response is in the from state, so response is parameterized uh, with, the, with the type. And it transforms it into a connection where the response is in the two state instead. And the return type is just unique. So using this type alias, we can express how a middleware transitions from one response to, to, to another. Um, can I ask one question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, what kind does that M have? Because can it have the usual monad kind, or does that have to have an additional star for the index you use for the index monads? Like, okay, so is it usually yeah. annotated, or? Uh, it isn't specified, uh, but uh, the, the M for the uh, index monad is a regular uh, star to star, I think. Oh. Uh, so the index monad takes some regular monad and provides some index spin on top of oh, it. Oh, so I see. Nest them. Yeah. yeah uh, I, I talked with Gary about doing like nested index monad. That, that was super tricky. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah we looked into it, but it was uh, very difficult. So this is like, yeah, it's not an indexed transformer because it, there is a way of doing that, but it makes everything more complicated. So we figured sticking with this for now, as it solves the problem, was probably the more sensible approach um, until figure out whatever magic needs is needed to make the indexed mana transformer stuff work properly. Um, but yeah, that might be a little way off. I need to spend probably a couple of days working on that one because it was uh, pretty mind-bending. Yep. <laughs> there were a lot of type parameters. <laughs> yeah. So very odd kinds and type parameters and just everything, yeah. <laughs> it was based on one of Conor McBride's papers, so that probably gives you an idea of what we were getting into. Yeah, the, the titles are nice, but just don't read the rest of the paper. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have this uh, type alias, and with it we can do super readable uh, type tests coming up now for, for expressing, if we go back, we want to, to kind of express this, the rules around this, right? Uh, so we do a type class called response. And uh, uh, it constrains this response uh, type, type parameter uh, to have these operations called write status, which takes a status and returns a transition, which is a middleware. A transition from status line open to headers open. And we have a write header operation, which takes a header, returns a middleware, which transitions between headers open and headers open. So just staying in the same state. Close headers does the sensible thing of just transitioning from headers open to body open. Send takes some B and uh, it, it stays in the body open state and just writes that B. And uh, that B has, uh, you see the functional dependency thing going on in the top. So uh, each response has some associated uh, body chunk type, which it can write, basically. And there's some other type class um, uh, overloading stuff going on to be able to respond with strings and so on. And do screening. And then the end operation is just transitioning from body open to response and it 
so uh, this is kind of nice. It's we see what's going on and what we can do with this. These are the operations. You can use them uh, directly if you want, but usually maybe you're not doing that. But anyway, you can see how how this oh sorry how this works when we do things in the wrong way. Here we do write status, and then we respond with some string, which ends the response as well. Uh, it isn't really clear here, but the respond uh, function is actually uh, send some string and then end. So it ends the response. But yeah, uh, in the wrong way here, we're closing the headers after having responded, which uh, cannot be done. And then we get an, a typer saying uh, couldn't match uh, body open with headers open. So uh, yeah, we have the safety at this low level, but maybe you shouldn't be, or maybe you won't be writing your applications at this level. But anyway, you have this, the nice thing is that you have the, the safety at, at the low level. You can always trust that this will be working. And when you're doing your kind of abstractions on top, on top of this, uh, it's safe. So one small abstraction we can do is a function called headers. We have already seen the respond function, which is a similar abstraction, but headers is a, a simple example. Uh, it takes some uh, foldable of f of the headers, and it returns a middleware which writes all those headers, transitioning from the headers open to body open state. And the implementation is, is very simple. Just Traverse with right header and then closing. Yeah, that was it for the for the core design things. So that that's that's really the the hyper API and, and what it tries to solve. And then we have things on top of it. So I'm going to talk about this type level routing, which is perhaps more exciting. I'm not sure, but this is really a, a clone of servant or a port, maybe, uh, which with some other design choices in some places, but mostly servant straight off. Uh, do you mind if I ask you a, your, your question about the middleware stuff before you get into the routing? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I'm curious about, uh, um, like, I, like ever since I like ever learned about middleware, I've always wondered, this is kind of a weird thing. <laughs> it's not exactly a function, and it's just like, I don't know, it's kind of a ambiguous. Though. So, like, have you ever have you ever thought about um, is it possible to get rid of middleware altogether and then just um, like construct the HTTP response in a, in a different way, or do you like the concept of middleware and that's like a big motivating factor behind this? And then, uh, like, another question is: um, is there right types of middlewares and wrong types of middleware? Um, like, it's okay to write a middleware that um, does the auth and other thing. But you can't have uh, like two middlewares that want to uh, respond with the body, right? So there's like some clear separation of responsibilities of um, middlewares, right? Like, are you opinionated on how middlewares should be designed? Okay, so the first uh, question about is this uh, like why this design and not like why a function in some other way? And it's a good question because I, I kind of <laughs> wrestle with this myself. Uh, I've been meaning to try to build something on top of this, which does uh, basically where you have functions returning responses instead, instead of having a chain of things doing effectful stuff and having state types to to track them, so they're doing the correct correct thing. You could do uh, just like. A function taking a request and returning a response, um, but there's first I, I got stuck on streaming. How to do streaming responses? Responses with that uh, might be possible to to return something which does later something like that. But yeah, I'm not sure how that would work. It would probably work, uh, but then um, there's some other. I, I really haven't explored that uh, that much to to say that it should be better or worse. But 
is the thing of like I, I've, I've done some examples with this uh, middleware uh, style chaining of things for doing authentication, and I, I guess you could do those with another another design as well. But uh, they turned out quite nice with uh, in terms of like type safety and like each each step providing something more. Uh, and you get the checking for uh, for like the subsequent steps need to have this uh, this field with this type or the authentication to be yeah whatever and and uh, the the composition is checked in a way but then again that might work perfectly with functions returning responses as well so uh, maybe that's a, a better approach and. I do want to try it. So this was kind of the first uh, first uh, shot, really. And uh, I'm not sure this is better than doing uh, returning responses. So maybe that's a, a second hardware. I'm not sure. Okay, okay. Thanks. I think it's really interesting, too. Yeah. Uh, and you had another question as well, if I'm kind of opinionated with middleware which things should be middleware or something like that yeah yeah um yeah because like in express there's middleware for parsing the body um and there's middleware for like authentication and there's middleware for um like what else is there i'm not sure but like parsing the body like it seems like that isn't exactly the responsibility of a middleware that might be the responsibility of like the you know your your business logic like how do you want to handle the response yeah 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 so some things perhaps just should be functions right mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. in your handler just yeah i want to parse this uh, i know this is json in this handler i want to parse it and then get back some value before some error uh, that perhaps is, is much more sensible than doing like a global because you end up with strange things uh, if you're doing certain things as middleware, at least at certain times, so to speak, or like if you're parsing all requests as JSON before doing routing, you're assuming all requests are JSON before you even know where they're going, right? And uh, things like if you're consuming uh, the request body uh, you can only do that once if you're not uh, caching it. So uh, stuff gets tricky when you have these ordering and then doing routing or something like that. So uh, perhaps it's better to defer those things that are really local to, to handlers or coming after routing and perhaps not doing them as middleware at all. Because if you take like in Node, you, you can chain middleware inside handlers in some strange way and uh, do like local middleware, but then it seems kind of shoehorned uh, in a way to, to use middleware for everything just because you can. Uh, so the reusability aspect might be nice to have like a single middleware uh, designed for everything, but uh, regular functions perhaps is better for, for uh, certain scenarios. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a pretty interesting area. So I, I appreciate seeing your, uh, uh, your design behind it too. But yeah, I, yeah. I, can, let you, I can let you carry on, thanks. But uh, it's interesting with the, like the function discussion and returning responses as well. Maybe that should be like a separate experiment to doing that instead and like side by side, what do we want, which is, which is better. So uh, if I get the time, either as things look right now, I will not get the time to do that as well. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we'll see. But this is uh, a starting point at least for something. Uh, okay, so uh, are there any more questions for like a basic API before we look at the uh, type level routing stuff? Okay, uh, so uh, this part is the servant-inspired 
part built on top of Harper. And uh, if you haven't looked at Servant or uh, if you're interested in Haskell and web, web development, I can really recommend taking a look at Servant. It's uh, really nice. So uh, uh, in this routing vein, we express uh, our resources as data types. And this is where it kind of uh, takes another direction from Servant a tiny bit. But uh, I've tried to put emphasis on resources, like RESTful uh, resources more, or HTTP resources. So uh, home here uh, describes a resource, and it just has a value home or constructor. And, uh, and there's a, a type called site1, which is a resource type, which supports uh, HTTP GET for home, and uh, it can return HTML. So the re uh, reason here that you can say get home instead of having two separate things like one separate get and one separate home is that different uh, HTTP methods can operate on different kind of uh, data types. But for this resource, you can only get home and you can only get it back as, as HTML. And uh, you can note here that uh, site one is only a type, it has no value, right? It's only a type, type alias. And the handler for this home resource is a function uh, which uh, is uh, using this except t transformer. And uh, so you might, might throw a uh, routing error here, or you can return a home value inside the monad. And the home resource only has this uh, constructor home without any parameters. So we just return it here for a simple example. Then we need to be able to uh, actually respond with HTML somehow. So we uh, provide an instance for encode HTML, which in turn provides an instance for something called uh, MIME render. But this says that uh, for this home, uh, home type, we can encode it as HTML, corresponding to HTML here in the resource. So uh, we're using uh, Smolder here to uh, as a HTML uh, DSL to uh, yeah render it as HTML. Oh, sorry. And then uh, comes the question: How do we pass these routing types to to other functions? because just having the type without no value seems kind of useless. So uh, we need to have some way of passing the type to, to the router. And there is a way of doing that. You might have heard of a uh, proxy, which is a way of uh, passing type information to functions without having any meaningful, meaningful value, uh, really. So it's just a, a proxy value for some type. And using proxy, we can uh, provide a value for this site one type as a uh, proxy instantiated with or parameterized with site one. And then we can create the router by using the router function, passing site one and, uh, and the home handler and this on routing error function, which if there is a routing error, you uh, can return respond with some HTML. And then we have something that we can start as a server. So uh, the site one router is a, is a hyper middleware, which does the whole, whole deal of responding. But usually we, uh, we want something more than just a home resource. So we uh, might want more resources to and, and some routing between them. So say that we want to uh, encode something like this. We uh, want a home resource still as before, and then we want to be able to get uh, a list of users and be able to get a specific user by some ID. And this is probably familiar if you're, you know, familiar with other uh, web frameworks and and their custom routing DSLs and and so on. 
But if we do this in, in the hyper routing thing or in servant, we see something like this. And here it gets kind of crazy. But uh, we have the home value as before. Uh, we have a, a data type for all users, which is could be a new type, but it isn't for some reason. Uh, anyway, it's just a wrapper around an array of users. And then we have a new type user, which is a record of the ID and name. And these are three kind of domain types. And for the routing, we provide this site to type alias, which uh, is first the same resource as before, uh, the home resource, which you can get and get HTML. Or, and that's the, I can't point here, but you see the, the colon less than whatever uh, infix type operator here, which is like the type level alternative. So either we route to the first resource or the second resource or the third resource. So they, these have uh, an explicit order here. So the second resource is under users. So the, the string here and the colon slash means under slash users slash, no, not the last slash, but just slash users. We have a resource. And uh, on the left line, we have slash users and then a capture. So that does the same as if you go back here. Uh, the capture corresponds to the colon user ID thing. So we take that segment of the path and try to convert it as an int. And then we have a resource. So by using these capture things uh, with some uh, tricky type stuff, you get uh, you get these captures as parameters to your handle functions automatically uh, with the correct type, which is nice. So when we write our handlers, and this one will be the same as before. And this is just returning uh, all the users. Uh, so get users is some kind of database access function perhaps. But the last one here, a uh, bit of code, but uh, you see that we take get user takes an integer as a parameter and then returns an XFT, yeah. Uh, routing error user. So uh, the capture is converted to uh, a, a parameter in this function call, and you get the correct type inside here. And you can use like, custom types. You don't have to use, if you go back here, you don't have to use integer for the capture. You can have like a user ID or whatever type and do some custom convert conversion from string to type. Uh, and then we just try to look at that user based on the ID, which could be a database lookup, preferably a yeah, simple example. Here you can also, as you see, we can throw errors uh, in this XFT to be able to respond with uh, 404 if the user doesn't exist. And you might argue you could have like a maybe user in your type uh, instead, but uh, uh, so I considered that and I looked through, high, uh, through uh, servants design discussions and so on and they seem to have settled that that would be too much magic. So you have to throw the 404 yourself here. Uh, a nice little bonus feature here of doing, uh, having the, the routing structure in the types is that you can get type safe links between your resources. So when we encode this all the users list as HTML. Uh, we're, we're going to first just write a heading and then we're going to traverse the users with the link to function. And the link to function does this uh, nice thing of applying a function called links to and where we pass the, the proxy for the site and we get back some, some value which we can destructure and here's the perhaps nasty thing where you destructure these these parts of your routing. Um, they have to to uh, have the same order. So you see, we're doing discarding some value, and then we have the uh, alternate thing and discarding another value and alternate, and then get user prime. So these three 
values correspond directly to uh, to these free resources in the type, and they have the same order. So if you mess up this order, you might get very uh, uninformative type errors. And uh, if you have like the incorrect number of arguments uh, here or something like that, that, that gets not so nice. But if you do it correctly, you will not get any type errors and you will be able to get this type safe link, get user, which if you pass it the corresponding capture, you get back an URI that you can use to link to other resources. So here we build up a list of, of uh, list elements with links in them for each user and we get the, the URI for free. And then we construct the application or the router using the same structure in the, as in the types, but for the, for the handlers. So a home is a handler and all users is a handler and get user is a handler. Okay, and uh, are there any questions for this part before we go into the last one? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, yeah. Could this maybe be, did you look into the polymorphic label stuff at all? And could the routing stuff be handled in a more, like in a nicer way with that? By like enabling you to use the, the label for it, like say all users or something, um, instead of having to pattern mesh all thing. Yeah, that has been uh, like, um, before uh, falling asleep each night this week, exact <laughs> that exact one has been <laughs> you know floating. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, 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 I've been meaning to to explore that to label uh, routes with some identifier instead of having this uh, icky ordering thing. Mm -hmm. That would be much better. So uh, absolutely, that would be. Uh, glorious if we can do that. I'm not sure. I haven't looked too much uh, like experimenting with the uh, label things, but it's that was my first like, oh, this is, I have to try this. I think I've already written to Phil about that exact, exact uh, thing. So, yeah. And, uh, and and one more question uh, uh, thought I had was, uh, if I remember correctly, yes or yeah. uh, could detect overlapping routes at compile time or something? Um, where you'd get a type error if your routes were like, if there were unreachable routes or anything because the captures. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't think so right now, no, but uh, that's an interesting point. I have. Would probably require a lot of type level computing. I'm not quite sure. How, I think it, it was done with template as funny as well, basically, which. Okay, yeah. Of course, an easy way out, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, nothing like that. Uh, okay. Yeah. okay, thanks. Good points. Uh, okay, so the last example of what you can do with this is uh, a bit about uh, deriving these AJAX or XHR clients as well. So um, in the same way we could can uh, derive the links to individual resources and have them type safe. We can derive uh, functions that for for accessing these routes over the network. So if we have like a single page or whatever progressively enhanced thing, we could uh, could uh, derive uh, like access functions to to request things from an API uh, instead of doing. Uh, just duplicating the knowledge of where these resources uh, are routed and, and what types they have and so on. And we can, of course, if we're doing both the server and the client in PureScript, we can share the, the corresponding types between the client and the server. So uh, a small example, similar to the one before, but we have uh, these domain types of, of tasks and uh, they have IDs. And we need all these instances for doing the JSON stuff. Uh, and then we uh, write this uh, task resource type. Here I have kind of split the, the resources just to be able to fit them on the slide. But uh, the task resource is a resource where you can 
get an array of tasks and uh, encode it as JSON. And the task resource with singular, no S, uh, you can get a single, or single task as JSON. And the routing type says that under tasks, uh, we have this tasks resource. And if under like slash ID, uh, we capture it as a task ID and we have a single, single task. So basically the same as with the users before. And uh, we have this site proxy, which we're sharing between the client and the server. So I'm not going to show you the server again, because it's similar to before. But the client, if you're using Pux, you would end up with something like this. So I'm not sure uh, Pux had an update uh, not that far ago. So uh, I think this is perhaps outdated. But anyway, uh, here's the update function, which takes an action and a state previous state and returns uh, this F model where you can do some effect and return a new state. So here we do ask clients from the site. So this is similar to links to some resource, but uh, we're, we're doing ask clients uh, instead and we get back a uh, structure, we, we can destructure and we get the all tasks function and then we just uh, yeah, use that and, and wrap the responding value in, in some, I think this is a, an event. Oh, I'm not sure how, how it works in Pux, but yeah, we, we do an Ajax request and we return something uh, in the state that we render next time. So uh, if these, this is kind of a, a bad example because the other function which we discard has a, uh, an argument, a task ID, which you have to apply to, to get the, the types of um, arguments for, for these accessory functions as well. Okay, and uh, just to kind of round off here, uh, there are some things you could, um, that I like to explore and that uh, you might want to, to have a look at later with this. And uh, there's come up some, there, some of these things we have talked about and some new things have appeared tonight, which is nice. And uh, well, I'll just list a few here. So type save forms would be nice to, to look more at. And uh, there's a package called the uh, digestive functors in Haskell, which is a nice starting point, I think. So maybe something like that. Uh, I'm not sure if we could do even more crazy things with the uh, polymorphic labels and and have I want to do something that's, uh, crazy where you're you're able to write like whatever uh, smolder HTML markup and then in whatever order nothing special really and then get some kind of type safety around you haven't included those fields or you are you have a typo in this field or something like that but it's Kind of, uh, perhaps a, a too optimistic goal, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, and then another thing I want to try is to do something like PJAX, uh, where, so if you remember PJAX hooked into links and forms, and when you request a resource, it sends it with, uh, sends a request with AJAX instead and says, asked the server to just render a partial, which it could swap in the ROM. But here we could do, if you request some, some part of, of the server, which normally responds with HTML, uh, this thing could hook in, request it to, with JSON instead, because we have uh, like support for content negotiation here, and request a JSON and share the templates between the client and the server, uh, apply the templates and swap that in as well, instead. Uh, so kind of a, a PJAX on steroids. Uh, you could do uh, like mocked servers and clients. This was uh, Phil's idea of using arbitrary to get some arbitrary server or some arbitrary clients that you can use that for testing and perhaps uh, property-based stuff or just uh, trying out uh, a client for some API or whatever. 
Uh, and then what we talked about earlier, this is kind of the same thing, doing uh, uh, an abstra abstraction on top uh, where you return the response instead of transforming the request and the response. Uh, so this might be an alternative to Hyper or something built on top of Hyper, not sure. And uh, the other backends would be nice to try out uh, the Erlang and, and C++. Okay, and uh, also just do cool, cool stuff and like the quest for type safe web. I think we have lots, lots more to do and lots more to discover. So uh, that's kind of it for me. And uh, just to summarize, um, I think uh, server side and single page apps aren't like a binary choice we have to to make and and discard everything around server side just to do cool stuff with uh, in the browser i think we should find a, a nice middle way and we should make tools that support doing that kind of middle ground way because it doesn't make sense to to write your documentation or blog or login forms perhaps or configuration pages using react uh, if you're not making any money out of that so if you're not like super keen on doing everything in react at least so i think we could like provide better tools for for that uh, intersection and use better languages and type systems so yeah that's it and uh if you have any more questions uh, i just uh, scroll past these references uh for the video perhaps if anyone wants to have a look at those later okay uh, are there any more questions around hyper or this server side stuff? I was curious about the PJAX thing. I never, I've actually never heard of that. I saw it okay. stands for push state plus AJAX, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Like, can, can you explain like the basics of how that works? So it, it returns like mostly the entire HTML document, but then like the browser will parse out the parts like the outside parts, like your head, and then just replace the body so that you're not reloading all the scripts for that compose the site. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the the client client side, which kind of instantiates PJAX, and the server has some common. They have decided on like this is the container for this application. You have. All this HTML, but inside this element, that's where stuff changes when you navigate or something like that. So you have perhaps you have like a top bar and a footer or something like that on a side navigation, and then you have the main uh, div where where your stuff is changing. And it, uh, at, in the client side, you say like, okay, we're going to use PJAX for that container, and then when you click a link, that's PJAX enabled, uh, it hooks in and requests the, the same resource which you would have uh, like uh, would have requested with your browser, um, but it re requests it with uh, the special header that's like X PJAX or something like that, which the server has to know about. So the server has to kind of switch on the X PJAX header, and if you're so, and it has to know about that container. So it has to be able to render the same page, but without the, like you said, the head element and, and everything else. So it renders a partial basically for the same page. So there's a, a common understanding of the main container between the client and user and the, the header as well. But that's a kind of small, price to pay to get a uh, more snappy snappy thing and uh, if you i think github is still using at least a variant of pjax so you see when you click some some file in the in the repository browser you know then you see this the blue progress bar spinning and then it changes the, that's some kind of derivative of pjax i think Oh, cool. Um, is yeah. there, is, that sounds like a little bit like a, there's a Rails thing called uh, like... Uh, Turbolinks, perhaps. 
Turbo links, yeah, it sounds like a turbo. Yeah, is it, is it the turbo links is. Uh, I think it's the same thing. Okay, but okay. more like, yeah, latency. Puck, like a PUX thing, and like the PUX is the the SPA, like you discussed at the beginning. Um, yeah. And so, like when the user requests one page, you actually send back that page and every other page of your app. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. You have like fifteen pages, but um, like guest users, like they don't have to access the. You know, logged in users, then like if you're a logged in user, you can like go to your account and change your settings. But if you're a guest user, you're, you're, you're never going to use that template, right? So you don't, mm. like, why send that as part of your spa? And then it's becoming more apparent to me that, yeah, um, having this kind of PJAX thing is probably a really good idea. Um, yeah, so that's why I'm more interested in that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I can re recommend having a look at it. There's some, some kind of gotchas with. If you're doing, it gets tricky when the pages you're requesting with PJAX or you're uh, like traversing links and, and loading with PJAX, if they have to have some kind of custom script initialized for their page, uh, stuff gets kind of tricky. And we're in a position where PJAX is becoming a bit clunky and Perhaps you could combine that with some kind of custom element thing in HTML to to get uh, like live updates in the DOM and and initialize scripts based on elements being loaded and something like that. But yeah, uh, we're kind of uh, misusing PJAX in a way to do fake uh, streaming updates as well. Just like periodically reloading the PJAX container uh, for some pages. They say like, please reload me each five seconds or something. And it's nice in a way because we don't have to duplicate anything or do anything special in the client. We can just have the, the correct parts be reloaded. Uh, but uh, maybe that could be a bit more slick. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. the main point of, of PJAX is really being able to provide something almost single page snappy, but without doing all the work. Yeah, there's a, a pretty hot framework. Um, at, least, at least if you count by stars on GitHub called the Next.js. And you know, after analyzing like, like how, how it works, it seems to be exactly PJAX, but uh, you know, spas that you write in React. <laughs> Okay. So, if, so if, if you load the page once and it renders, just, and then if you click on a link, then it sends a request to the browser and a bunch of Webpack magic will take your React thing and then render it into a string <laughs> and then send it to mm -hmm. the browser and then it'll re render. But the interesting idea there is it has uh, the concept of prefetching links. So if you load a page that has three other links, you can prefetch some of those so that mm. when you actually click on it, it renders instantly instead of waiting for the browser come back with that. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty excited about these kind of stuff right now. I haven't heard of Next.js. <laughs> it's, it's probably the most stars you'll ever see on a GitHub project. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Must be good then. <laughs> it must be good. Yeah, PJ yeah. sounds fun really when you have some when you have some jQuery components somewhere in your web, in your app that store the state and don't know, and then you just. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any other uh, uh, questions uh, around hype or something? Maybe, I'm not sure. Do we have like other topics we should talk about tonight as well? Um, I'm not aware of any. Um, oh yeah, the the puck slide. Uh, one question: You packer mesh on the to client thingy in the in the update function uh, in a real app. You'd probably pull that out into its own module, right? Because the it's like the handlers don't depend on anything that the update function gets passed in, so that you don't do that packer mesh on every update. Yeah, probably. And then you don't have to like you if you do the packer mesh once. You have the proper names, and you don't need to remember the positions in the update functions. Yeah, sure. You can like pattern match in your main 
function or something like that. Well, that's good. Idea. Uh, yeah, it would be. Uh, and pattern, yeah, and close over over the specific functions. Does that is S clients? Does that live in in F or can you? Is that like shouldn't that be a pure function? So you can it's just a, do it in the top level. Does it need to live inside F? Like, do you need uh, to do the pattern no. matching main? No, it's uh, it's a pure function, but yeah. uh, it's a pattern matching part that. Uh, but you could return a record with all the all the thingies in them or something. From yeah. The module. Yeah, but if you had the label uh, magic, you can skip that as well. Yeah. I think in, um, in the in the servant examples, they're doing uh, top level pattern matching. Yes, which you can do in Haskell. Yeah, but not in PureScript. Right? So. Um, yeah, but labels to the rescue, I guess. I hope so. Um, Just don't make any type errors and everything is fine. Yeah, <laughs> do the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do the wrong thing, but if you do, you're, <laughs> you're screwed. <laughs> and you will know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how many of you are like uh, doing server side stuff? Maybe not the servers in PureScript, but like things around PureScript or backends that PureScript clients are using that that you're doing some some kind of server side web or API development. Yeah, my server side stuff is in PureScript Express right now. Okay. I was doing Node, backend Node, until last week, basically. Um, yeah, change yeah. jobs. Uh, so much pressure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I mean, I I felt the pains that you listed, basically, especially when you combine the whole stuff with um, with streaming. When the whole thing is resource constrained, you get into like nasty situations with asynchronous stuff where you are not like you're trying to set like some status code, but in five percent or like zero point five percent of your requests, the like incoming uh, like the thing that you stream through was too fast, and you're already in the body part or something, <laughs> or like and so none of your unit tests or or, or integration tests ever catch it, but you just get these weird error logs or something like that. So. I think you told me about this uh, yes. This example. I've been using that as a scary example. <laughs> you had some very proxied things and you had error handling going in between the proxying or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. I mean, uh, there are, uh, I guess, doing that proxy thing and doing their handling, I'm not sure, I haven't tried, but I think you shouldn't be able to express that in this design at all, because it would be impossible to. Well, connect. you can't properly like handle the error. Like if you're streaming through, and then like you're streaming, you're just proxying a request, and then all of a sudden the um, the party that you're streaming from disconnects. Yeah, you already streamed through the two hundred, and you now have an incomplete <laughs> body you stream through. So, but but there's nothing yeah, more that you can pass through. Change your mind and, and yeah. do something else. And you just can't do anything. You just have to cancel the request at that point, but you can't signal that there is an error happening, at least on sure. the HTTP. Yeah, and I mean, uh, you shouldn't be able to code something that tries to do that uh, at all, because it's nonsense. Well, yeah, it's the fastest thing you could do, but. <laughs> yeah. You can't, if you can't, if you can't uh, accumulate the whole thing, like the whole body in your, in your service. Yeah. I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's another thing you can do, actually. No, exactly. Maybe your architecture is bullshit in that case. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> what kind of stuff are you okay. streaming? I've never had to write a streaming. Um, oh, the, so, so the situation was there was a monolithic application that was written in Java servlets or something, and they were uh, trying to massively expand that application. But uh, the monolith was, well, yeah, they wanted to be hip and want a microservice implementation, and so they needed a proxy in front of that so that they could like switch off parts of that monolith part by part and uh, 
and like reroute some of the traffic to the microservice infrastructure and build that up while the old thing still continued running. And oh. yeah, the, the old thing was kind of huge, so you can't, uh, like the only thing to handle that performance was to just stream everything through. You couldn't accumulate all the requests that happened from that thing. So the proxy was Sensibly. streaming? Yeah, the proxy was streaming the monolith, responses from the monolith, basically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. But if that canceled the request, yeah, he was screwed. I wonder if it was <laughs> worth it. <laughs> Proxying into microservices. Big benefit. Yeah. I had a similar scenario where that was like a, a, a microservice setup as well, but we did the, I guess in hindsight, the wrong choice of having a single like API gateway thing where which, you know, proxied all the internal HTTP servers. Yeah, I may, I may, I maintained the gateway. Sorry? I, I maintained the, the gateway was part yeah. of like the same. Yeah, it's horrible. Uh, and we did <laughs> uh, express uh, proxying stuff, the streaming thing. But, uh, yeah, that was tricky. And uh, but yeah, uh, th there are some. I've I've tried to to do some examples uh, in the repo as well for doing streaming responses with Hyper. There, there's at least one example, uh, which turned out quite nice. So I guess you could like try to do this uh, streaming example or like the proxying example, uh, but. Uh, I haven't tried to do the, the full thing yet. But the the core design kind of supports streaming, uh, so that's that's kind of nice. Um, but uh, I think the the middleware architecture of you know having the con and and just streaming or chaining functions operating on the connection came out of like I didn't know really how to do the streaming in a, another way. Uh, it it it's very natural with this design. It's, it's a bit more tricky with uh, function taking, request returning, and response design. But I think you can do some kind of overloading uh, thing with a, a function and uh, in, inside some f thing, and you can do the streaming. So maybe it's worth doing like a, a, a hyper killer. Thing with the <laughs> simpler API. Perhaps the, I'm not sure about the state, because the, the nice thing here is you can do some, you can write the status or, and you can write the headers perhaps, and then you can kind of leave that off. That was one middleware doing that. If you have a, a chain of, or, or some kind of nested calls of functions, transforming, taking, requests and returning responses and then transforming those responses you're I guess you're not sure of how they transform I'm not sure how to make the types uh, tell you how they transform that response before it gets passed up to the server and, and sent uh, if you lose some safety around that uh, not so sure but Maybe it isn't a problem. So uh, that's the kind of closure ring approach. <laughs> yeah, one, one thing I wondered about is like, uh, if you, as soon as you get uh, concurrency in there, um, you can't do the state tracking anymore, right? Like you can't do it within, like, uh, with within one thread, basically. But as soon as you have, uh, if, as soon as you fork an F or, or something, you can't track anymore. Uh, like, you don't know if the other thread has closed the headers by now or not. Right, mm -hmm. so you need to make sure that the thing you fork off does not uh, make tr state transitions or, or you need to somehow join it back or something before you, uh, 
before you proceed closing the head of section or something? Oh, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, if you're, you have to, uh, tricky. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's one of the more trivial program problems. Uh, concurrent programs are kind of easy usually, but. Yeah, so the the, the index monad thing has the, the you know the, the benefit of controlling through through the bind operation where mm -hmm. where stuff happens and you can't really progress or can't really apply the effect without changing the type. But I'm not sure how that interacts with like forking threads. Perhaps you can do uh, illegal things if you can do that. Uh, you should well, try to break it. <laughs> it's not really f uh, fork in the. No, in not the, forking it in Node. Uh, no. yeah. But uh, yeah, you, you should try to break it and see if you can <laughs> find a loophole. Do my very best. I'll uh, post like a, a bounty for <laughs> $10. A mention, a mention on the refund. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Hey, is there anything? Uh, yeah, Chris, were you talking about forking like in the in that server itself? So, like, if you start up like a hyper server, then each request that receives it like forks and lets the response respond in a fork. Is this what you're talking about? Yeah, basically, when you you're in a handler, right, and you. Um, and you won't need to make a bunch of requests to other uh, to other other services or whatever, but you don't want them to run like you could. I think you could do the parallel thing where you use the wrapper, which which does a bunch of requests in parallel, and then you can wait for them at once, uh, which is like promise all in JavaScript. But um, but if you use fork instead and just have them write the result into a ref or something and or have them uh, like write write their results um, you basically lose track of the control flow and and then uh, yeah you, you lose any chance of synchronization basically and then tracking the state of the request does not work anymore I think okay. It should be interesting to 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 poke at that with uh, yeah it with, like with hackers. Um, yeah, but it's not. Is it a responsibility of a web server like Hyper to um, actually like fork like handle each request in a different thread, or is that like handled by? Um, I'm not talking about forking threads as a system level threads or right. like green let threads or anything, but the fork f function in particular, which is a function in the PS code f package. Right. Um, which um, that yeah that that that's for like user land ho um, code handling the request, right? But I, like I wonder if uh, oh yeah that never mind. I'll wonder I'll wonder offline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, I, I, I think. Uh, but, and did important? you have like a separate question for for thread handling? Oh, okay, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, I think Rightfold answered my question. Nodes HTTP will spawn a separate uh, app thread for each request. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. <laughs> Thanks, Rightful. Um, yeah, I think maybe we can uh, uh, stop here <laughs> if, if nobody else uh, has any other questions to discuss. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot for taking time out of your Saturday evening, Oscar, to host us. <laughs> host sure. They have, uh, they have quit their parting and taken off elsewhere so <laughs> it's been uh, uh, yeah it's been cool here um, 
And uh, thanks for, for having me here. It was uh, very, very nice to talk with some pure scriptures. And I didn't have to explain the syntax, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye.